Welcome to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly show where I get to answer your tech-related mountain bike questions. So don't forget, you can fire them in at the email address that's on the screen right now. You can hit us up on Facebook, and of course, you can add them in the comments below. Use that hashtag AskGMBN if you're emailing them in. Just makes them nice and easy for me to find so I can answer them quicker. So our first up this week is from Gary Buttery. Doddy, I'm six foot two, recently bought my first full suspension bike, a YT Jeffsy. Nice choice. Uh, the size chart suggests I should have gone for a large or an extra large. I went for the large as the forum said, better for trail as lower and better control. XL would give a higher riding position, thus like an XC touring riding position. Have I made the right choice? Um, just picking up on that forum thing, it sounds a bit confused to me because if you go for a smaller bike, so the larger is the smaller, the XL is the bigger. The smaller the bike is, the more upright a tall person will be on it, and the larger the bike, the lower and more racy your position. So it actually sounds like they're the opposite way around. So in your case, the large will be more of a comfortable position than an aggressive position. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you're definitely at the upper height for what that bike can have. Of course, if it suits you, that is great because you've got to feel comfortable on it. If it does feel a little bit on the short side for you, there are some small things you can do to eke out a bit of length and make it feel more comfortable. Going for a slightly wider bar can just bring your position down even lower and just open up your arms a bit. Slightly longer stem can do that as well. Although with a nice bike that's quite aggressive like that, you don't want to go too long. If it's got a 50 mil on there, the absolute longest I would go for would be up to a 70. But really, you only want to try and go by 10 millimeters if you can. Uh, if you want to make it feel longer, lowering the stem can also have that same effect. And of course, putting the saddle slightly rearwards on the rails can do that too. If you're having to do these things to extremes though, then you're probably at the upper limit of that bike and an XL might have suited you better. I would always recommend people to go for the bigger bike that they can fit on because I'm just a believer in a slightly bigger bike is going to give you a bit more room. And I talk about it quite often, but that equilateral triangle principle, you've got your wheels and your body weight. If you're, if you're on a nice large bike, it's going to be nice and stable and your weight is going to be on that middle line of the bike. If you've got a shorter bike, you're going to be higher up and you're going to have that sort of pendulum effect with your weight. So whilst that's great because the bike feels agile and stuff, it may feel a bit nervous on the descending and when you're climbing steep terrain, the front wheel can come off the ground a bit easier. Of course, you can get around this with different suspension setups and tweaking things like putting those wider bars on. So you haven't necessarily made the wrong choice, you just got to make that choice work for you. So good luck with that. Next up is from Richard B. And actually, this is just a comment in relation to last week's uh, maintenance video where I showed you how to repair sort of little minor scratches on our fork stanchions. I fixed my stanchions with super glue and wet sandpaper. Worked great. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned super glue in there. I mentioned epoxy resin and paints and various other things. But of course, super glue is a great substance because it's rock hard by the time it's actually dry. Of course, if you do use super glue, make sure you don't get it in your hands because uh, sticks them together pretty badly. Next up is a question in relation to the capabilities of bikes you see pro riders using. It's from Franz Fleming, and this is quite an interesting question actually. So he says, I've got a question about trail bikes and the limits. I've just seen Ollie Wilkins riding his Focus Jam down the streets in Mexico, but is this good for the bike? So is it possible to ride a trail bike on downhill tracks or is this just too much for the material, the frame and the parts? Well, firstly, I mean, Ollie is a very, very good and very accomplished rider. He could ride a hardtail down that track. So don't confuse like, the bike with the skill. You know, a skilled rider is always going to be able to ride a lot more on any level of bike. And of course, there is a limit to what bikes can do. Whilst that bike obviously can withstand that, Ollie is not putting undue stress on it. I mean, he's a hard rider and he does put a lot of strain on the bikes, but landing into flights and steps on that is actually a little bit smoother than you might think because it still acts as a transition. It's those hard impacts like flat drops. That's the sort of thing that's not going to do a bike any good. And I haven't actually checked that video out to see what particular spec Ollie's got on his bike, but he normally runs quite heavy duty sprung 160 mil fork up front and heavy duty tires and really strong rims. So a lot of those components are gonna take the strain and he almost certainly will have his rear shocks set up to handle the big shocks and big impacts. So of course, you can do this on those sort of bikes and you can ride downhill trails. You often see people in places like Whistler Bike Park riding just regular trail bikes. And in fact, last summer I rode my just 150 mil Travel 29er there and it was absolutely fine. And I think it was probably nearly as fast as the Canyon Sender, which I also had out there. 
It's just the fact that you ride the sender through the rough stuff, you can obviously ride that a lot quicker because that is what it's designed for. So just take that into account and also bear in mind that at the end of the day, if you're riding your bike for what your manufacturer deems unsuitable for the bike, you do risk not having your warranty honored if anything does happen to that bike. So just make sure you check the warranty and if you're not sure about it, definitely consult with that manufacturer or your bike shop. Ultimately, the point is there's a very fine line between what's suitable for off-road use and what's considered off-road abuse. And that is certainly the line that the manufacturers are gonna have in their warranties, because they have to cover themselves against bikes being used for stuff like what Ollie's doing that's really not designed for. Next up is a hardtail-related question from Keith Potter. Um, question, at which point do you give up on a frame? I've got an old Kotick beefy 26 inch, so I think that's a steel 26 inch frame, uh, which I love, but it's needing new forks and 26 inch forks and parts are getting harder to find. Is it time to move on to 27 and a half? Well, the first thing I would say is if it ain't broke, do you need to fix it? You know, maybe you can just get more life out of your bike if you're quite happy riding it. Granted, 27 and a half inch wheels and 29 inch wheels are commonplace now, but they're still producing 26 inch tires, 26 inch rims and wheels, and of course suspension forks. So yeah, they are hard to find, but Rock Shocks have got quite a lot of them and some good ones as well. So this is worth considering keeping your beefy. I'm very much in opinion that you should keep riding by it as long as you, as you want, really. So they've got the Revelation in RL and RCT3, so that's the better damper. And those forks are available up to 150 mil travel. And I know that that beefy, they can take a quite long fork, I think about 140. So you could run the 150 on there, which is the RCT3, and I think the RL is 140. But obviously with the RockShox forks, you can take the travel down internally with the air tube. So that's not that much of a concern. They also make the Reba. So if you want a slightly lighter build fork and of course the Pike, and they do that in the RC. So there's quite a lot of range from there. I did look at the Fox site and of course they don't really do that. They may have some older stock or stuff they're not really promoting on the site, but generally theirs is 27 and a half and 29 inch. And of course, Tire companies, Continental, Maxxis, Schwalbe, they're all making their major tires in 26 inch. You wouldn't have to worry about that. And if you were, you can buy like a bit of a stockpile of tires. As long as you keep them flat rather than sort of folded up, they'll be absolutely fine. And keep them out of direct sunlight and that's the sort of stuff that keeps them perishing over a long time. Uh, and again, rims are easy to get. You can get them built up. Any decent bike shop will have a selection of spokes. I really don't see any reason for you to actually spend that money and lay out for 27 and a half, unless you're just hankering for a new bike, of which of course there's nothing wrong with that. If you want a new bike, get a new bike. No problem at all, but you don't need to is the point. So next question is from John Hyde and it's a suspension tuning related question. Uh, have you guys done anything with suspension tuning or changing shim stacks? Have you ever done a push tune or something similar? And is it worth doing on a cheapish Fox CTD performance boost valve shock? Also, are you ever planning on making a DIY suspension tuning for dummies or anything like that? And is it simple to do? Um, I've had my shock in the past push tuned and I've had various other tunes done on there. Of course, that is a shim stack based system and it does make a significant difference, even in fact, more so to the cheaper end shocks. So you can get really good results out of them. I don't know on that particular shock exactly what the suspension companies can do, but this is something I, I want to learn more about. So hopefully I can learn a load and I can tell you guys how to do that. Um, but I love the idea of doing a sort of a basic tuning yourself at home sort of thing. So perhaps I will go to a suspension tuner soon, learn how to do it, the fundamentals, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what messes up the shock, what makes a big difference with those shims, we've used the big ones, the thin ones, the wide ones, whatever. Um, yeah, and I'll come back to you on that because I think that's a really good, solid idea. Next up is a tech tip off from Spoon who sent us this massive document, is the best way to describe this, with frame sizes and dropper posts and dropper post lengths and drops and uh, measurements. And it's basically how you can identify the maximum drop post you can get into your frame uh, with a simple sort of calculator that's built in there. This is a really cool thing to use. It's got most of the measurements out there for most of the brand dropper posts you see on the market like KS, Fox, RockShox, whatever. Most of them are on there. And it's a really good idea if you're struggling to, to work out what size drop post you can get into your bike for maximum leg extension and drop. Um, I think that's a really good effort, Spoon. Thank you for sharing that. As long as you don't mind, we're gonna put that in the link below so everyone else can see that. So check that out and it gives you some really cool sort of nerdy, geeky info so you can find out what spec dropper post you need for your bike. Next up is a Crank Brothers pedal related question from Francois Penchard. Uh, Dolly, what about the Crank Brothers double shot pedals? Clippers on one side and flat on the other. I've used them for the last two years and after getting used to turning them on the fly, I find they're great. 
Um, clipped in for climbs and easy descents, but I unclip and go on flats when the terrain is too difficult. And I found this kept my confidence up on gnarly terrain. Uh, yeah, the double shot is a great idea. So for those of you that aren't sure about this, it's on the screen right now. On one side of the pedal, it resembles a flat pedal. Spin it over to the other side and it's got the clip mechanism on there. So there's a few concept ideas behind this. One is that you can use a set of clipless shoes on there and you've got the ability to engage in the pedal. But like Francois said, if you're riding a bit of terrain you're a bit nervous about, you can unclick and put your foot on the non-clipper side, like the flat pedal side. So you've kind of got the best of both worlds. It also means if you just want to go to the shops or for a casual ride in a pair of trainers, for example, you don't have to change the pedals off your bike. So yeah, a double shot is a great idea. So although Francois says that they're they work for him and it's easy enough to flip the pedals over during the riding. Really for out and out dedicated use, you're not going to beat like a flat pedal or a clip pedal, of course, whatever suits you, but they definitely have their merits and they're obviously working really well for you, Francois. Does anyone else use anything like that? I'm not sure there's many other examples out there on the market. If there are, let us know because I'd like to see them. So let us know in the comments below. Uh, Clay Marnes, great fan of the show. I really like the attention to detail. I've got a grippy question. I come from BMX and I really can't stand lock-on grips. Do you have any tips to secure my ODI long necks to my bars besides glue and wire? To glue them on, such a mess to get them off, yep, agreed. And to wire them on, not only it looks bad, I've already cut my hands on it. Cheers. Okay, so let's look at the best solution first and then we'll deal with what solutions might work for you. So Renthal, the makers of motocross grips and bicycle grips, what they recommend is using a dedicated grip glue or a grip cement like they actually produce and wiring them on as well. And then when you wire them on properly and you push the end where you've crimped off into the grip, it won't actually touch your hands. You can do this really neatly, but I do understand the concern with that and also about getting them off afterwards. I know some people that use the top up paint that comes with bicycles and the little pots, paint that onto the bars, slide the grips on, but again, getting them off is a really messy process. Probably the best solution for you, although bear in mind, it's never gonna be quite as grippy as the others, and you can suffer from throttle grip if moisture gets in and breaks the seal, is to use hairspray. So spray some hairspray on the, on the bars, slide the grip on, leave it until it's set, and then basically that works really effectively. I know a lot of people that use that technique, but when riding in really wet and muddy conditions, sometimes you can break that seal just through ripping on the bars basically and if any moisture gets in there it creeps its way in and you'll have a throttle grip so it's up to you really but i think that's that's the best solution that's not the ideal solution oh and one other thing actually i've totally forgotten about is some handlebars have rough roughened patches on the end particularly for sticking grips onto. I know I had some nukeproof carbon bars turn up a while ago and I noticed they had that and they like a padlock system so the grip can slide on and it's got an extra adhesion. Imagine using like um, a carbon compound gripper for the bar on the stem just to help it grip and stick. Same concept, but it's really built onto the bars. So I'm sure there are a few other manufacturers out there that have something similar. So that might be useful for you too. Next up from Sean Thomas. I've got a specialised hard rock hardtail frame with a 30.4 mm seat tube. Yeah, so that's quite unusual. You typically get 27 twos and you get uh, 30.9s and 31.6, and then occasionally 34.9s on uh, some GTs and Konas and a few other random brands. Um, I want to add a dropper post, but as you know, they don't come in that size. Yep, correct. I've read online conflicting information about using a shim and a 27.2 post. Are there any problems I should be aware of, or is it fine to shim up to a 30.4 from a 27.2? Okay, so it's not ideal, but you can do it and you can get good results with it. Now, the most important thing when using a shim is make sure you use a really long shim, and you want that shim to extend below the sort of top of the frame. So it's got to go below the welds of where your top tube mark is. Because if it's just an extended part of the frame there, you're going to put a lot of stress on that and any sort of leverage is going to potentially create damage to your frame, the seat post door, or everything. So I have done this in the past using a USE shim. There's going to be a link in the description below to USE. There's a British company, they do export um, to various countries, so hopefully you'll be able to get one of those. I managed to make it work successfully on a Kona Honzo frame. It was a carbon frame and I did it with a 31.6 seat post and shimmed it out to fit the 34.9 frame. Now the shim itself was probably about four and a half inches long, so it had a good amount of support to it. But of course you have to bear in mind that the longer the part of the frame is that sticks out that's unsupported, 
the more of a bad idea it is to do this. So basically as long as that shim is as long as possible and extends well into the main part of the frame, you should be okay. However, many bike manufacturers will frown upon this and it is worth checking if you're worried about your warranty in a, in a manual that came with your bike if Specialized have anything to say about it. But if that's what you really want to do and you want to get a drop post in your bike, that's pretty much the only way of doing it and it will work. So our next one is from Cohen Van Schiepen. Hey Dolly, love the series. I grabbed a new mountain bike this January, a Specialized Chisel Hardtail and the bars are 720 millimeters wide. Sometimes I get back from riding with sore wrists and other days I have no issues at all. Same riding, same trails. Uh, I'm almost two meters tall and love the way the bike handles with that bar. So how do I get rid of the wrist aches? Okay, well, there's a few different factors to wrist ache and where it can come from. It's not always the handlebar. First thing I want to draw you to is the saddle position on a bike. If your saddle is too far back or your saddle is angled down, that's naturally going to put you into a forward position and put more weight onto your hands. So make sure your saddle is at a level angle and it's obviously sort of somewhere centralized on that seat post and that should be that okay. Next thing to consider, of course, is the roll of your bar. So you obviously like your handlebars and you want to keep those, that's fine. But do consider that they do have a slight sweep, a slight bend to those bars. And ideally you want that bend to reflect the natural sort of sweep at the offset of your, of your arms. You know, if your bar is too straight, you're going to end up with your wrist at an angle and that's going to put undue strain on the outside of your hand. And on this part of your hand here, you've got a thing called the ulnar nerve and it extends all the way up your, at your arm, but it's quite exposed here. And if you put undue pressure on that, you can suffer soreness and numbness. So definitely consider trying moving that around. The other option as well is to get some different handlebar grips because handlebar grips need to support your hand and again, reduce the pressure on this area. Now there are loads of different manufacturers that make different thickness grips, different durometer grips, so they're springy or softer. A lot of the cross country bikes I was checking out last week were using foam grips to make them as comfortable as possible. And one of our supporters, um, Ergon Grip, they make a, a grip that's got these little wings on it and I've actually got a bad wrist on my right arm, so I was actually considering trying those out myself. And that model is the GA3, so that's their latest sort of enduro grip. It's just on the screen now, so just note it's got a slight profile just to the back of the grip. It's just to add support. And if you imagine that being slightly flatter, it's just going to give you your wrist and your hand a bit more comfort. So that could be something to consider as well. Finally, the other thing to consider is the height and the length of your stem. So if your stem is too long, you're going to be stretched out and you're going to have more weight on your hands. And if your stem is too low, you're also going to have more weight on your hands. So you may find you need to bump the stem up a little bit or have a slightly shorter stem. It's all sort of little trial by error. There's no right and wrong, but when you find your sweet spot, you'll definitely know about it. So I suggest you check those few things out and then just try it bit by bit, process of elimination, and hopefully that will be the end of your problems. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Hopefully I've answered some of your questions or maybe helped clear up some things you weren't sure about. If you've got any questions, please fire them into the email address on the screen and add them in the comments below. I'll be on there later on sort of checking out your responses and hopefully we can help you next time. If you want to see a couple more great tech videos, click right down here for Yaroslav Kulhavi Specialized Epic. Really cool bike with amazing paint job on there. And it's going to be raising some money for charity as well. So it's another reason to have a look at it and share that one around. And if you want to see all the XE tech related stuff I saw at the UCI World Cup opening round in Stellenbosch, South Africa, just at the weekend just gone, click down there. And as always, click on that globe to subscribe. We love having you guys on board. And if you love this video, give us a thumbs up.